Hello, I'm Katherine Davis, a member of the League of Women Voters of Rochester. I would like to welcome all of you tonight, the candidates, the audience, and those viewing at a later time to this forum sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Rochester. We'd also like to thank our generous partners of tonight's forum, the Rochester Post Bulletin and the Rochester Public Library for their help. Due to the current pandemic, we are limiting attendees to the candidates and necessary volunteers. Guidelines for social distancing and the wearing of masks are also being followed. The League of Women Voters is a, a volunteer organization organized at the local, state, and national level to engage citizens to participate in government. While we as a league do study and take issues on stands, we never support or endorse political parties or candidates. The views expressed in this forum are those of the candidates, not those of LWV Rochester or any partner or sponsor of this forum. And the sponsorship of this forum is not an endorsement of any candidate. It is our purpose in sponsoring this forum to provide you with an opportunity to hear candidates discuss face-to-face -face issues that are important to you. Tonight's questions have come from LWV Rochester, the Post Bulletin, and members of the public. If you would like to submit questions for a future forum, please visit our Facebook page at League of Women Voters Rochester, Minnesota for information. Questions must be submitted at least 48 hours in advance. As there is never enough time to cover all the issues in a limited time and setting such as this, please feel free to contact the candidate's campaign headquarters directly if your questions are not addressed tonight. We'd like to thank all candidates running for office for offering to serve their community and for the enormous time, dedication, and commitment that running and serving demand. We encourage our members as individuals, as well as each of you, to get involved in your community and the political party of your choice. Welcome to tonight's forum, which features candidate for Rochester City Council Member at Large, Council President. Candidates for the seat are Brooke Carlson and Kathleen Harrington. Each candidate will have two minutes to offer an opening statement. The candidates will then respond in turn to questions provided by LWV Rochester, this evening's partners, and by the public, which were submitted in advance. Candidates will have 75 seconds to answer. The candidates will then have two minutes each to make closing statements. I would like to suggest to candidates that you make your answers as succinct as possible. It isn't necessary to use the entire time for your answer, but please do finish your sentence when your time is up. We would like to cover as many questions as possible. Each candidate also has three 30-second rebuttal cards. These can be used at any point after each candidate has answered the question. Only one rebuttal card may be used per question. Please put the card in the basket after you have used it. The timekeeper tonight is LWV Rochester member D. Vodal. Questions from the public were checked to ensure they follow our guidelines by LWV Rochester members Maggie Brimajoin, Jane Callahan, Deb Duffy Smet, and Kathy Swessel. Asking questions will be Randy Peterson from the Rochester Post Bulletin. And with that, candidate Carlson will begin with their opening statement. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, League of Women Voters, for having me, us here tonight to the Post Bulletin and others w tuning in to watch us. I'm Brooke Carlson, and I am so pleased to be running for Rochester City Council President. I was born and raised in Rochester as part of a family who is deeply committed to our community and to improving our world. It is both my job and my passion to work every day to bring public and private partners together to find shared solutions to some of our community's most significant challenges. I am a small business owner, a leader in the nonprofit community, a public health professional, a community volunteer, and a mother of two young sons. I know I am uniquely positioned to help our city navigate these difficult times. 
My expertise in urban planning, public health, and human services enables me to guide efforts to create strong, inclusive communities where people and businesses can thrive. For example, as at the Minnesota Department of Health, I was part of the core team that led the passage of state legislation to improve health outcomes and reduce health care costs statewide. I brought together bipartisan representatives to guide the development of a $47 million program serving 86 counties and nine tribal governments. More recently, I convened 10 counties, multiple health systems and health plans, and community-based organizations to build the governance structure of our new Southeast Minnesota Regional Mental Health Crisis Center. Through my role leading the nonprofit consortium, I have been directing our cross-sector community response to COVID to ensure we're using our collective resources to meet the needs of people experiencing crisis. The COVID-19 crisis has, shaped, has reshaped the landscape of our community. A favorite saying of mine is, with breakdown comes breakthrough. This is our chance to innovate around issues that matter to us, like childcare, transportation, housing, and economic development. In this time of uncertainty, it is my sincere commitment to bring our many voices together. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Candidate Harrington. Thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you to the League of Women Voters and the Post Bulletin and to the library for hosting us tonight. And I, a special thank you to all of you who have put on so many forms, well over a dozen. What a tremendous um, contribution to the community and public affairs, and I thank you for that huge commitment. Um, I also thank my opponent, Brooke, for being on stage with me yet again. We, I feel like we're a road show. Um, we're on the road together quite a bit. Um, I have great respect and affection for her and um, consider her a very formidable opponent. But I want to use this time um, to share a little bit about with me, not what I've done, but who I am and what makes me tick. I've found throughout campaigning that people have great ideas of who I am and what makes me tick. Um, and I want to share some of the things that I think are true. Um, I was a single mom. I raised my daughter, who now is a mom, and I'm a grandmother at this amazing stage of life, falling more and more in love every day with this adorable child. I'm the daughter of working class parents who, for the life of them, could not understand why I insisted on and wanted to go to college. Ever since I was little, I believed getting an education was going to be, make a difference for me. So I was the first in my family to go to college. I really believed it would help make a diff me make a difference with my life. I'm now and have always been blessed with relentless energy, optimism, and passion to make a difference. When I see a problem, I jump in. I can't help myself. I've, as a young woman, I worked in Washington um, to help other women get elected to Congress. I saw another problem a few years ago when the chamber was in trouble. I left my job at Mayo because I believed in a community like ours with a one large employer, small business and other organization needed a strong, vibrant voice. I'm running because I want to help everyone recover together, become the most inclusive city we can be, and create a vibrant, um, sustainable life for all residents of Rochester. Thank you. Thank you. For our first question, candidate Harrington, you will start. What do you think will be the most challenging aspect of being president of the city council? I think questions where you have to say the most anything are always hard. But I think the most challenging aspect, if I have to answer that, will be to really work together with city council colleagues to create a shared vision that we can all work towards. And I'd like to do that in three ways. One, and I believe I have the strength and the experience to run a strong meeting where debate is welcome, encouraged, and it is robust but not divisive. The second thing I'd like to do, and with the collaboration of the mayor and the other council members, as I said, develop that shared agenda and work on it in collaboration with the administration to affect, to impact the agenda that is brought before the council. And the third thing is to bring about a new kind of outreach to the community, where the council members go out together to the community, have informal hearings, formal hearings, meetings with the community to hear the, the residents' opinions on issues well before we have to vote on them. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Carlson. Yes, 
there is not one answer here. We're facing a terrible public health and economic crisis that affects every one of us, regardless of our political stance and disproportionately affects people of color and small business owners. We're all in this together, and like so many of you, I'm worried about the finances and health of our families, friends, and neighbors. We're facing an impending eviction crisis, and few have a good solution to childcare right now. The problems are big and complex, and we need to get creative and get unified and use our tools in our to toolbox. Only through collaboration can we tackle these important issues. Also, like many of you, I am sick of the divisiveness present in seemingly the smallest of issues because my skills are in facilitating across challenging dynamics to have productive, forward-moving conversations, I believe we can reach new ground. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, um, we'll begin with candidate Carlson. Um, how involved should the city council president be in setting policy for the city? That is a good question. So I, I had a chance to speak with the county or with the city attorney today, and I've been reading all the code of conduct and procedures to make sure I have an understanding of where exactly where we're starting and what the city council president's role is in setting policy and setting meetings. So the city council president has an equal voice on the council. The role of the president is to preside over the meetings and make sure that those meetings are productive and we are successful in moving through the agenda and reaching decisions where we need to. The city council president, only with other council members, has the ability to set the agenda and uh, prioritize issues. But the city council president is on the DMC board, so that is a unique opportunity for the council president to weigh in and ensure a positive direction and that the city is well re represented in DMC decision making. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Harrington. I believe the role of the city council president in setting policy is he or she is but one vote. Um, but I also believe the, the role is very substantial in listening, learning, and leading the other council members in what they think is important policies and together coming to a consensus of what policies we want to raise up for consideration by the administration to vet. So I think it is important for the city council president to lead in that effort, but the leading and the power of the leading and the influence gained um, exercise that leading comes from really listening to the mayor and the other city council members, especially as we go out into the community together to understand what people need what people are interested in. But as far as a single voice, I say no. The, the, it's one vote, and, but a voice that can listen and lead and learn with the other city council members. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Randy Peterson and uh, candidate Harrington, you will begin. Both candidates have experience dealing with health policy at the state or federal level. The city does not have its own health department, however. What do you see as the city's role in dealing with public health concerns and addressing potential health policy changes? I think the city clearly has a role, again, in listening, learning, and leading in all matters of policy. We may not act on that policy, but we can certainly advise other bodies of government. And most importantly, in terms of public health, I think the city has to be a committed, informed, engaged partner with public health and public, um, and helping to inform them and the, their constituents, the city's constituents of the needs of public health, but being the best partner, improving our partnership, I think would be a primary importance. So public health policy can inform other governing bodies of interests and opinions of our constituents, but um, being the best partner in public health, I think is the primary role. Thank you. Candidate Carlson. Sure, thank you for this question. Never has this been more pressing than right now as the city and the county and others in our community need to work together 
to promote public safety and public health in our community. Public health and health are influenced by a number of underlying issues. So even if the city doesn't directly influ or directly address health policy, the city is working on a number of, influ of issues and has the ability to um, influence issues related to housing, transportation, economic development, and workforce development that are critical in promoting a healthy community. So as part of our network of agencies and partners across the community, we have the obligation to identify and uphold or up identify our shared goals and interests as a community so we can direct resources to give people the very best opportunity to thrive and uh, succeed through this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this first question will come to candidate Carlson. Since 2000, several city and county departments consolidated and now some are separating. How is this going to affect cooperation between the city and county? Great question. Again, during COVID, we've really seen some exceptional examples of how the city and county are working successfully together along with the school district and, and Mayo and our nonprofit community that we can build on and grow from. And I know that there are challenges in the past of the city and county and others working closely together, but this is a place we can, with the leadership turnover coming on so many levels, start fresh, create new space in working together and identifying what is best for our community when we are serving the same people in many circumstances and our resources are scarce, but we can still have greater impact when we work together. So collaboration is a core principle of mine, as is efficiency in using our resources. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Harrington. I think when you examine why some of the, the departments between the city and the county separated, the root causes are a little different for each separation. But bottom line, we have to really understand why we need to work together. And when we do on issues like transportation, we have to have honest dialogue about the differences we have in visions for the future. And this absolutely has to be mediated. We saw this happen with the whole um, issue between and differences of opinion between the city and the county on College View Road. There were different views of the future and different perspectives on the role of each body, the county and the city, in getting to those different futures. So I think what we need at the very beginning is a honest, truthful summit between the administrations and the elected officials of the county and the city talking about the plans, the goals, the visions, and the points of, di of disagreement and how do we go about um, collaborating to minimize those. Thank you. Thank you. This next question will start with candidate Harrington. What is your opinion of the DMC plan? Would you like to see changes in the plan? I think the DMC has been very successful in accomplishing its mission, which if we go back to first principles, it was really to set up an environment that could leverage Mayo Clinic intellectual property and assets to attract more businesses to this community, healthcare and bioscience, and to improve the experience downtown for patients and for other visitors and residents. I think DMC to a large extent has accomplished that mission. So I think the plan going forward um, needs to be, and I would urge the city to become much more involved with economic development as it has intensely been focused on downtown. The city must be much more focused on the other parts of the community, the 50 plus square miles of Rochester that are not located downtown. So I think DMC has accomplished its mission it's, broke some, it's broken some China along the way. It's been misinterpreted, but I think in large measure, it has achieved its initial purpose and we look forward to working with them moving forward. Candidate Carlson. Sure, thank you. So far, DMC has really focused on what's beneficial to our downtown visitors and people who work in, the, in downtown. 
Looking ahead is the opportunity for DMC to more meaningfully and directly engage with our greater community and figure out what is beneficial to all of us who live and work here. People tell me all the time that they're so concerned about how DMC is in negatively impacting their taxes and that they want to see direct benefits. There are direct benefits to our community of DMC. I think DMC has the opportunity to speak about those more clearly, especially as we're moving ahead. In my role leading the nonprofit consortium, I've been very fortunate to work closely with DMC staff and figure out new ways of working together to engage our community, including those who have been marginalized in the past, in designing our spaces to not only benefit our community, but to be inclusive and welcoming for all of those who visit, live, and work here. Thank you. Yes, rebuttal. I, I, if I understood the question, it was, did DMC accomplish its mission, or I interpreted it that way? And as I answered it, um, to point of clarification, because I believed as the statute speaks, the mission is focused on the downtown corridor and some extension. So yes, I believe it has. I do not believe it's the mission as per the statute to affect the rest of the community. That's why I think it is so important for the city to take on economic development in the rest of the city. That's not DMC's job. Thank you. Um, this next question will come from Randy Peterson. Oh, oh and sure. sorry, one, yes. one moment, please. Yes. Good points about how DMC is focused on downtown, but issues like transportation and extending the Second Street corridor are beneficial to our community. And in fact, so many of the people that work in downtown aren't necessarily able to drive and park. And we don't want, as a city, to be adding parking spaces, which are very costly, but we still need to get have safe, affordable ways to get in and out of downtown for those who work there. Thank you. Thank you. And now our next question will uh, come from Randy Peterson and um, candidate Carlson, you will begin. And the last answer, this will build on that a little bit. Um, the city is planning a bus rapid transit route along 2nd Street Southwest and Southeast, connecting a proposed transit hub to the west at the west end with regular service into downtown. Is the current proposed project the right fit or should it be adjusted at some point? Very good question. And I know there's a lot of different perspectives on this issue right now. So I'm really in listening and learning mode to make sure that we fully understand what the investment from the city is in order to bring in those um, significant dollars. With every design decision, we need to be sure that we're thinking about and including in our process early and often those people most impacted by such decisions. In this case, of course, there are business owners that are potentially going to be impacted and we need to be thoughtful as a city about how to support the businesses during development. We also do need to be forward thinking as a community right now. I know we're living in crisis and I know that we have so much work to do to get us through this next couple years but a transit project such as this creates longer term opportunities for those to not only get in, in and out of downtown, but to, ve to develop that corridor in a way that does benefit our community and the people who live in neighborhoods, including my own neighborhood that's connected to that space um, to better access uh, different areas of the community. Candidate Harrington. Would you repeat the question sure. please, Randy? The city is planning a bus rapid transit route along 2nd Street Southwest and Southeast, connecting a proposed transit hub at the West End to regular service into downtown. Is the current project as proposed the right fit or should it be adjusted in some way? I think determining what's the right fit when we can't define the new normal is challenging. But we also have to move ahead. It takes years to get the funding necessary to to complete such a project from the federal government. So it's really important, I think, to keep moving ahead, but with an eye towards modeling potential new, new normal, and which is why I'm so pleased the DMC has hired a, a very reputable firm to do some economic modeling of different um, speeds of recovery and to really try to, from that, extrapolate to what a new normal might look like. So I think in evaluating the BRT, long term, there are many um, variables that have to be considered, most especially what is work 
place um, in telecommuting going to be going to look like in downtown in the future. But right now, I'd say it's really important to keep the applications online um, to move ahead with applying for the federal funding in particular um, to keep the planning moving ahead, but with an eye towards that defining that new normal. Thank you. So um, candidate Harrington, we'll start with this next question. Some people say that the interest of developers receive too much weight in Rochester. Do you agree? Please use examples and practices of Rochester policies to explain why or why not. That's an interesting question. It seems to have a bias within it. Um, I'd say the interest of development in Rochester is the interest of the city. We talk about how much more we need affordable housing. We talk about how we need uh, especially um, transportation to and from that affordable housing. I believe we need more small businesses outside of the downtown core to thrive and, and, and attract new businesses. That requires a real good partnership between the people who are going to build, rebuild Rochester. Some of them are the developers who invest their money, who put themselves at risk. Others are the labor unions. So I think we need a good partnership between the city, the, the, the unions, and the people who put themselves at risk. Thank you. Candidate Carlson. Sure, good question. And something that I have heard a lot about from people during my campaign and having the honor to speak to so many different people of so many different backgrounds, feeling like that their voices aren't necessarily heard, and, and especially in the development process. As I said before, I think there's an opportunity, and I've been trying to learn more about how we ensure that community voice is engaged in processes early and often, so the impacts on our community are considered in these various development projects. But I don't think there's a, a negative, um, there's not a negative partner here. It is a partnership between our city and our community and our developers in, make, in guiding these decisions and using data to identify where there are strong opportunities for affordable housing, or in particular, I've been really trying to learn about for senior housing because that's such a challenge and we need to be thinking about issues of equity in our development. So developers are part of the uh, solutions and helping our community grow in an equitable and just way, um, but it's not necessarily one voice over the other in that um, planning process. Thank you. Candidate Carlson, you'll start with this next question. Let's stay on housing. The lack of small houses, townhomes and apartments has been an issue for our workforce for many years. What is the city's responsibility and what do you propose to do about this situation? This is such a key question right now, and obviously will continue to be so as our city grows and we add more jobs, especially in the service sector. I believe it's the city's role to dig deeply into our toolbox to think about options to increase affordable housing. Uh, we need to build on strategies like TIF and, and zoning um, R2X and transit-oriented development that allow us to grow differently and smartly per our comprehensive plan. But I'd also like to say uh, think, uh, something important about affordable housing as we so often talk about this issue. This is a very multifactorial issue. And to keep building a strong, diverse workforce, we need to pr promote affordable living, not just affordable housing. This means supporting policies around childcare, transportation, workforce development, and supporting people in their career pathways as well. Specific to housing, I also think it's problematic to fo focus largely on rental housing, as we should be absolutely also talking about affordable home ownership. We have some good models to learn from and ways of setting standards for affordable housing that keeps those home ownership costs low. As resources allow, I think we also need to be thinking about wealth building opportunities, including down payment assistance programs that have been recently lost or launched elsewhere to support generations to come. Thank you. Candidate Harrington. I've been campaigning since the beginning on my belief that the city has to step up and own the challenging issue of affordable housing. Increasing affordable housing stock and rental options must be a top priority for Rochester. 
I don't think we can any longer rely on the county or the market to fix the issue. I don't think that can happen. So first, I think we have to examine and eliminate some of the current barriers that we have put in place that prevent or make it challenging to build affordable housing, such as the parkland dedication fee. Let's understand the opportunity cost of the fee and the structures that we've put in place to build affordable housing, which I think that would be a great first step. Second, I'd propose that we develop a process, a discipline, to measure the financial impact to housing costs of some of the various proposals that come from all the different departments, similar to a fiscal impact analysis that the state has, but apply that to affordable housing um, development. And I applaud the city's recent announcement about reorganizing its bureaucracy on planning and zoning. I think that will be, that is a great step forward in more collaboration and greater efficiency in the development process. Thank you. Candidate Harrington, you'll begin with this next question. If the council has reasonably cut everything possible from its general fund spending and it still has a deficit, how would you proceed in seeking additional funding? Well, I think the premise of the question is, 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 should be challenged on its face. Cutting all that you can is something that is very, very um, difficult to do and a difficult examination. Right now we're looking at the budget where we have $100 million out of the $500 million or so dollar budget cut. Only 30 million of that 100 million comes from operating expenses. The other 70 million comes from deferred maintenance, the CIP. So I think we can and we should look harder and deeper. I know small businesses that are doing that every day, families that are doing that every day. So I think before we look towards increasing taxes or finding hidden fees to increase revenue, we have to do a better job at examining that. And I think that could be done by the community together, not just the administration or the council working alone. Thank you. Candidate Carlson. I also think that the idea of cutting uh, a budget is short-sighted. One of my roles in leading the nonprofit consortium is identifying ways to have more strategic partnerships to increase operational efficiency. I believe that efficiency has improved at our city, but there are still opportunities to explore how we can increase efficiency and reduce costs. If we are looking to raise additional funding as a, as a taxpayer, as a small business owner, and as part of a family who has experienced job loss over the COVID crisis, the idea of paying additional taxes is not very appealing right now. How do we leverage the great work we're doing across our community that we've built during the COVID crisis around our collaboration to access different sources of funding than we've had access to before from outside our community? So I believe that raising taxes is not the solution here. Looking for ways to increase efficiency and potentially um, utilizing this incredible collaboration we've built to access resources beyond what we've traditionally explored. Thank you. Um, candidate Carlson, you'll begin with this next uh, question. Um, how does the Rochester community make sure we never have a George Floyd incident? I just knew you were going to ask that question for some reason. Okay, such an, impor such an important question. Um, had so many incredible conversations as, as trying to figure this out. You know, we are, we are in a moment in history where we have the opportunity to reimagine public safety and hold informed, community informed planning at the center of decision making to create a more just Rochester. As I always say, we're building on a strong foundation of our policing here in this community and with our city leadership, which are actively seeking and making, making reforms informed by our community. These efforts give me hope and I believe we can shift our paradigm and promote a culture here with supportive policies and practices for policing where it is needed and assign resources more, to more upstream supports 
and sy systems like social workers, community, paramet excuse me, community paramedics, and mental health professionals to reduce negative police interactions to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think there are four factors that are critical to ensuring the best public safety program and confidence the community can have in law, uh, law enforcement. Their leadership, culture, transparency, and citizen engagement. From the leadership perspective, I think we are fortunate in Rochester to have Chief Franklin, a person who came here with a commitment to President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force principles and a belief that training is essential. In fact, the RPD requires twice as much training as the state does. Um, he also understands that diversity of the force is really, really important. And in the two years he's been here, 14 of the 24 new hires are women and people of color. So I think he is an effective leader. Culture, leadership matters in that. And I think he is driving that culture down through his uh, department. And he leads believing, believing that you should police with your heart. Transparency, we have to have an understanding of what the force, what police is asked to do and how they respond, and we have increased tools. Citizen oversight is critical. It's up to us to make sure that the culture is good and strong and positive. And, uh, and finally, I think we need to have, in order to prevent an incident like George Floyd, empathy. Empathy for all those and walk in the shoes of a mother or a father with a black son. Who Thank you. Give Thank him you, the talk. candidate Harrington. Thank you. Yes. We believe training is key. In fact, I had the chance to speak to a mom who needed help restraining her 11 year old son with a mental health diagnosis on two separate occasions. Her experiences varied greatly between her first interaction with well trained experienced team, uh, an experienced team of officers who leaned on her expertise as a parent compared to those who came second and caused such trauma that she, and she is now reticent to call for help in, the, in a future situation. Thank you. Our next question will come from Randy Peterson and candidate Harrington, you will begin. What, if any, incentives would you support to encourage property owners to maintain and restore designated historic buildings in the city? I think the question of historic preservation is a very critical one for this community. And incentives are always talked about as the primary driver. I think they're part of it, but I think having a vision for what we want to preserve and what preservation means to us is really, really important. So I am very pleased with the city planning's approach, the city planning department's approach to historic preservation. I believe they are coming out with a development plan with um, uh, outline of what will be done, what kinds, how we will preserve not just the, the brick and mortar, but also our cultural history. So I believe the incentives should flow from that. I think they should flow from the desire of the community of what we want to preserve and how much we want to preserve it and the economic impact of doing so. Candidate Carlson. Good question. So I think that the historic preservation is a great example of how we are using citizen engagement in one of our formal boards and commissions to work with our city in partnership to develop a plan for what historic preservation could look like as we have future development in our downtown. I think there are some important principles in that plan and we should be sure that we're acknowledging that there is uh, there are multiple sides to this issue. As somebody who grew up in Rochester, I find so much value, of course, in preserving the wonderful things about the culture and the actual look of our historic buildings downtown. Yet I also understand as a business owner that there, there are costs to doing such, um, to, to preserving those buildings in that particular way based on what is being recommended. So again, I don't think it's an either or, I think it's both bringing together the vision of our collective community and figuring out what is doable and how we do encourage through um, different tools that the city has available to it. 
preservation. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Harrington for a rebuttal. The Historic Preservation Commission is absolutely passionate about their mission, absolutely committed to preserving and protecting the buildings that they have designated or they believe or worthy of designation. I believe it is equally uh, necessary to make sure that in their work they seek really deep, deep input from others that could be affected. And I would hope that um, that could be the case going forward. Thank you. We'll uh, begin with candidate Carlson for this next question. Do you favor a system of new city fees such as sidewalk fees to equitably increase revenue? Would you use this to offset property taxes? Is there going to be a parks question later? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really hesitant to say I support any additional fees at this point. Um, there is sort of what we're facing right now and what we may be working towards as a community in the coming years. So right now, my understanding of such a sidewalk fee is to help offset costs for one property owner or a small group of property owners that may be heavily, um, uh, have the expenses heavily upon them. So this would spread out that fee um, more equitably across the community. It just doesn't feel like the right time that we should be promoting fees unless we are bringing it to a broader um, segment of our population to weigh in at, on a vote. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Harrington. I'll confess, I don't really understand this issue completely. I've heard the bumper sticker arguments on both sides. I would need to really dig in a lot more to the economics, the rationale, and the long-term value of it before I gave a, an honest opinion. I am just, I don't think I am well enough informed on this at this time to say so. I've heard both sides. I think there's probably more that I want to learn about this issue. Thank you. Candidate Harrington, you'll answer this uh, following question uh, first. How should Rochester ensure financing for quality of life items such as the library, parks, civic theater, art, and music? Well, I think those are, rightfully so, line items in our budget, if I understand correctly. Um, I think we have to learn how to manage those very, very effectively especially as we face fiscal um, austerity going forward. So I do think it is an important city responsibility. It's a civic responsibility. So it is and should be part of our tax base and our budget. I am concerned about increasing costs and having special fees attached to cover any additional expenses before we have really strong oversight into um, the effectiveness, the efficiencies, and the sy have systems thinking been applied as much as possible in all areas of spending? Thank you. Candidate Carlson. Good question. Rochester is a great place to live. We need a budget that both improves and maintains the city. The key budget priorities, of course, are infrastructure, public safety, and quality of life, the kind that are strengthened by resources such as our award-winning public library and our parks and recreation facilities. Infrastructure is sewers, but it's also people, the people who live and work and thrive here. We need access to these wonderful resources, plus things like affordable housing, childcare, transportation, as well, of a, as well as a variety of opportunities to grow in our careers. So while our library and our parks might not be what come to the very top as priorities, they uphold our quality of life, which is a commitment the city has made to our community. And I'm sure many of you, like my family, have leaned heavily on these resources in the past months to maintain our mental health and our quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Carlson, we'll start this question with you. Um, how does, um, 
I just lost my question that I was going to ask. So I'm going to ask this one. Do you feel our current conflict of interest policy sufficiently provides the transparency it is supposed to? If not, what changes are needed? Point of clarification, conflict of interest policy related to council members? What is it most pertinent to? I would say the conflict of interest policy related to, um, to the city council. Okay. Well, I haven't looked at the conflict of interest policy lately, so it is worth another review. And like I said, I've been meeting with the city attorney to make sure that I understand the different policies and make sure that we know as council president, but also council members, how we're sure to abide by city's expectations. I do believe we, we certainly need to um, declare what those potential conflicts of interest are as we do on our other boards, including those that I sit on, to make sure that we are not um, benefiting from the city in particular ways. And certainly as a, contract, as a consulting firm owner, that's something that I have been very thoughtful about even during my candid candidacy, that I am not directly benefiting from any city funding right now. Thank you. Candidate Harrington. Thank you. I'm not aware of, uh, of this deep and specific for, um, provisions of the, the conflict of interest policy, but in the interest of avoiding any conflict of interest, I let my board know quite a, a few months or as soon as I decided to run for council that I would resign come the end of the year, win or lose, um, because I did think it would be um, a conflict. Um, I would also obviously recuse myself if ever a, any kind of issue came before me, which I would doubt there would be, but if there would be one that would have any kind of even um, the appearance of self-dealing, I would not be um, involved with voting on that issue. So I would obviously, if elected, study it carefully and make certain that I adhered to it uh, religiously. Thank you. Candidate Harrington, we'll begin with you, and I found the question I was going to ask before. What is your commitment to increased green energy, especially as our city's RPU contract with SEMPA is reaching an end? Well, my commitment to our city's green energy um, development is very, very strong. I think it is not only in the interest of today, it's definitely in the interest of the future um, clearly for our, our children and our children's children. So I, I support where RPU is moving. I support uh, goals that are, you know, very um, uh, high and strong and drive as much innovation as we can. Energy is changing every single day. Um, so keeping up with it is really, really important. Also, moving more towards green gives us great opportunity for economic development, for the development of clean jobs, more jobs in our region. So I am in support of the agenda to move forward as quickly as we can because I don't believe it's in conflict to good economic growth. Candidate Carlson. Thank you. Well, I'm so pleased to have just been endorsed by the Sierra Club as I have a strong background in sustainable development as well as serving on state and local environmental commissions. I feel very positive and committed to the green energy goals and the 100% renewable energy goals. I believe that we are committed to our future generations and to our global community beyond Rochester and that it is not only related to energy, but being thoughtful about our development and issues around transportation. Um, I also believe that not only does the city have a role in promoting green energy, but our business community and our nonprofits, the organizations that are here have the opportunity to increase their efficiency and reduce energy expenditure to begin with. Thank you. Thank you. And Candidate Carlson, this question comes to you first. This past winter, the city, in cooperation with the county and nonprofit agencies, provided shelter and services for people who are homeless. What should the city do about this issue going forward? Well, through, through my role leading the nonprofit consortium, I did sit on a committee that was working with the city, the library, um, and the county and our nonprofit community to figure out sh both short and longer term solutions to support people experiencing homelessness. I think that we, excuse me one second. 
uh, I was very pleased with the work that the city has been part of so far during our COVID crisis, both with utilizing resources like our Mayo Civic Center, as well as now working in partnership with Salvation Army and the landing to ensure that we have extended hours at our day center to support those experiencing homelessness. We need to ensure that the city is a player at the table and not necessarily the one driving the conversation or leading the work and investing all the resources. We as a city have tools already in place to work in partnership in our community around affordable housing but, um, and homelessness prevention, longer term strategies that best support people experiencing homelessness to be successful on their, their future paths. Thank you. Candidate Harrington. Thank you. Um, addressing homelessness is both a moral obligation and a policy imperative for our community. And the city has to take an active role in the collaboration with the other agencies addressing this issue, including our, um, the county, the state government, school board, um, and important nonprofit players, Mayo Clinic, the chamber. I was really pleased to be a partner with the city and the county and Mayo last winter on behalf of the chamber in creating the warming shelter. We learned many lessons during that time and now during the COVID experience as well. And one of the main lessons we learned is that the causes of homelessness are as numerous as the, the necessary solutions. So the needs of a family experiencing economic dislocation are very different because of temporary unemployment, are very different than those of someone with serious mental illness, addiction, or a criminal record. So we need to look at the individual or family and work with them as we in the county and the civil, service, civil excuse me, social services and nonprofits work together to meet individual needs um, in a collaborative effort, not looking for one size fits all solutions, but being humanitarian, compassionate, as well as creative. Thank you. We are at our last question, and candidate Harrington, you will begin. From your observation, has the increase of salaries resulted in a broader spectrum of people running for city council? My, my observation of it? Absolutely, and I supported increasing salaries to engage more people across um, the economic spectrum in running for office. It is critically important for a community to have people of all different levels, educations and backgrounds committed to, run, to public service. So yes, I think it's had a very positive effect. Um, I did not support the process by which it was done, but the outcome I think is very, very positive for the government process. So I, I and I am very pleased with, with that impact. I do think it's important to to run and to make sure that that commitment is very, very strong as I pledged in my case to, to make certain that I represent all voices and serve as well, but I am pleased with the impact of increasing the salaries and the range of candidates. Thank you. Candidate Carlson. Sure, so while it was tackled in a, in a way that turned many people off, including myself, and we are asked about this all the time, so believe me, I wish it would have been handled differently. I do believe it has provided incentive and encouraged candidates from all different backgrounds to run in our current election. We have had such a great breadth of experience, life experiences and expertise come to the table during this election. If we look around and really see what's going on in our community as we in are increasingly diverse in both race, ethnicity, and in um, economic diversity, we need compensation for the paid work that people might otherwise have to give up to serve. Even if we agree that it was done wrong, the new salary increase does address the disparity, the disparity of opportunity that many of us don't necessarily see. I think it's the obligation of our next council to ensure that processes better engage uh, community in order to increase transparency and avoid misunderstandings such as what happened. But I do support it and I do believe it has influenced candidacy positively. Thank you. Well, that concludes our question portion of the evening. Um, we will now hear closing statements from each candidate. Candidates, you will have two minutes to speak and candidate Harrington will go first. 
Thank you, and thank you again, Post Bulletin, League of Women Voters, for organizing this and so many other debates, and for the library for hosting. Rochester is a great community, but the events of the past few months have shown us both the fragility of our economy and the serious and painful gaps we have in opportunity, equity, and quality of life for so many residents of Rochester. I'm running because I believe we need change. Change in how we view and treat each other, change in how city government responds to the needs of all people in, in Rochester, and change in how the city council operates. I'm running on my record of strong, passionate, and inclusive leadership and ability to drive positive change. As a city council president, I will listen, learn, and lead to the council to ensure that all voices are heard, all perspectives are included in robust, respectful, but not divisive debate. Let me conclude where I started. I told you I was the first to go to college and much to the chagrin of my parents. They were not pleased with my decision. But I know before they passed, they understood the importance of education to me and my commitment in my life to make a difference. I believe they'd be proud of my ability to build bridges and get people to work together toward a common purpose. My dad, in particular, would be very proud of his daughter being endorsed by the tradesmen and women of our community, the carpenters and the pipe fitters, the people who build our community. And he would also be so pleased of having the support of so many self-made job-creating small business men and women in our community. So I'm confident and very hopeful that we can rebuild our community together. I pledge to make certain that we can have a recovery for all, not just a few, that we become the most inclusive city we can be and have a high quality of life for all residents of Rochester. To learn more about me, please go to my website, voteforharrington.com. Thank you. Thank you. Candidate Carlson. Sure. <clears throat> I believe you should support me as your candidate for city council president because I'm not only a small business owner and work hard to be a trusted leader in this community, but I'm a mom of young sons and a, and a daughter of parents who live here too. And I understand we, both, we need both to uphold our high quality of life and grow it across generations. I'm at the heart of our community's collective work efforts to support people and create efficient, just, and thoughtful systems that work together to meet our shared goals. My strength is in learning from a broad array of voices to find that shared value and move our work forward. I'm not an activist in the traditional sense, but I'm active in, within the systems to bring business and human services together to make Rochester a better place to live and a better place to do business. I want this community to be the very best it can be for people of all ages, abilities, and backgrounds so they can thrive for generations to come. Budget shortfalls demand we be bold and creative and make tough decisions when we need to. This will require new public-private partnerships to address issues around transportation, affordable housing, and economic development. The same old ways of doing things with the same old players is not going to work. I'm committed to learning from what we have done really well as a community and learning more from our community to inform how we build systems where we've had deficits. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Please do check out brook2020.com for more information, and I do have a series of my positions listed there for those who are interested. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to thank each of the candidates for participating in tonight's forum. Thank you for your service to the community and for your willingness to, depart, to participate in the democratic process by running for office. I would like to remind you that the views expressed in the forum tonight were those of the candidates, not those of LWV Rochester or any partner or sponsor of this forum. Thank you to our partners, the Rochester Post Bulletin and the Rochester Public Library. Remember, Election Day is November 3rd and that early voting has begun. If you have voted by absentee ballot and would like to change your ballot based on what you learned tonight, please visit mnvotes.org for information on that process. Please do remember to vote. If you have a question about your polling place or would like to see a sample ballot, visit vote411.org. 
To see this forum again, access, to the, access the forums from the Rochester Public Library website. Good night, everyone.